This is the story of a school in the Bahamas for children with special needs and the extraordinary woman who overcame personal heartache to create it. The story is like the old folktale of Stone Soup, in which a traveling stranger tells a group of hungry villagers he has a magic stone that makes delicious soup from plain water. The villagers end up creating the soup themselves when they each contribute a little something to the pot. They learn that the entire community can benefit and overcome any obstacle by acting together. In our modern version, this wonderful soup is a school called Every Child Counts, and the community that benefited is the Abacos, a group of Bahamian islands and keys that seem like paradise. But sadly, the children here with special educational needs once faced a bleak future. Lynn Major realized that her adopted sons, Vincent and James, just could not learn in the regular school system. She discovered that the Bahamian government had no resources to provide alternative programs in her community. Servicing the needs of dozens of little settlements scattered across hundreds of islands and keys is a huge logistical challenge. Because we are an archipelagic nation, Unfortunately, on most of our islands, we do not have alternative schools, and that would be schools for students with special needs. They're outside of the normal funding process, and um, unfortunately, a lot of them are just home with parents or grandparents if their parents are not able to relocate to New Providence or Grand Bahama, where there are special schools. Those, those students are just basically home. The children who fall into this category have a spectrum of physical and mental challenges. Being severely disabled and unable to walk, having Down syndrome, being developmentally delayed, or learning disabled. Nearly all of them have suffered because of the stigma of being different. You know, a lot of these students um, have a difficult time um, uh, with the stigma of disability and uh, other school kids will um, call them names. I don't know if I, you, you wanted me to mention that one story of, uh, of, of this one student of ours who lost his front teeth because he could not spell when he was very young and in an elementary school couldn't spell the word cat. And uh, they, just, uh, they just pummeled him for it and he, they, they, they uh, busted out his front teeth for that. The social stigma of special education affects the parents as well as the students. Mr. Huell Moss, Jr., himself a high school principal, had a problem admitting his daughter needed an alternative school. Being the, the parent who didn't want to publicly admit that, you know, my child is um, um, some um, 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 mental condition, um, we, I still kind of forced her into the regular school setting. To me, that school was horrible because they used to treat me so bad because I was just in grade seven or eight. And these other students from the other grades could um, tease, they tease me, laugh behind my back. They treat me like nothing. So I had to um, go to inside the office and just cry it out because I couldn't take it no more. It wasn't until I got back to Abaco, my second stint, that I decided, you know what? I'm gonna let her go to Every Child Counts, which is the only school on the island that addresses her particular problem. And since then, it has been like, tremendous. It's been like night and day. She has responded tremendously to the program there. They all have a learning disability. They have to be taught differently. They're more visual, taught a little slower, taught a different way if they don't get it the first time. Uh, I'd say 99% of them are dyslexic, which is not a learning disability anymore, but it certainly hinders their learning. Domenico suffered an injury to his brain when he fell off a swing. 
I had like a problem. I couldn't like read or do the stuff that I couldn't do because I had a learning disorder after it broke my head. And the first time I came to school, I feel like I was uh, I was needed to come here because the teachers always helps you. Right. I don't know the rest. But, well, it's okay. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and like, it always used to be hard for me to learn, and I try my hardest like to do what I have to do. The teachers like always helping you. Like if you miss and do something bad, they mostly don't really like mind it. They will talk to you and like try to guide you back to the right path. Every Child Counts is the school that was desperately needed by this community. Just like the soup in the old folktale. It has nourished all these children who would have been forced to stay home or been left to struggle and suffer in the regular system. But without a series of dramatic events in the personal life of one woman, it might never have come about. The lady who started it all is Lynn Major, the mother of two adopted boys, James and Vincent. How she became their mother is where the story of the school begins. Hopetown is a village on a little island near Marsh Harbor, Abaco. It is the home of Lynn and her husband, Truman. We were married for 10 years, but three years after we were married, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then in the next 10 years, our family was diagnosed with the gene for breast and ovarian cancer. So uh, we had a lot of deaths, my mother, my aunts, and then a number of people sick. And then we lost um, two of Truman's brothers in the plane, um, missing plane. And so we had a lot of um, losses during that year. And so we decided that at that point in time that maybe it would be uh, time to kind of move on and start some new different experiences. So we decided to look into adoption, which wasn't easy because of our ages. At that point, we, I was 43 and had a history of cancer. And so it wasn't that easy a process. We said we would take two children, and Truman preferred to have boys than girls. So, so we said, well, we'll take two boys. So we found these twins in, that had been in an orphanage in Jamaica from the time they were one day old, actually. So that's how kind of we found them. With Lynn being American, Truman Bahamian, and the boys Jamaican, the adoption process dragged on and on. Since the boys had just been left, it proved difficult to get any genetic information. So by the time that we actually were ready to bring them home, they were actually three and a half. So we had expected that there would be delays, developmental delays and other issues. I think it was probably within the first six months that we realized that the disabilities were more serious than we had anticipated. I knew that we were going to have some challenges as to what was going to happen. But when they actually started at the Hopetown School and they just couldn't concentrate and couldn't really focus. And I think the whole school setting was just too overwhelming for them. This was just not the right kind of education for them. And it, they were just not going to be able to really um, achieve in that, kind, in that regular environment. Lynn had discovered the enormous problem that had already been encountered by other parents in the Abacos. Myron Sawyer's mother, Dawn, is just one. He has Down syndrome, and his main problem right now is his speech. He needs a lot of work in that area, his low muscle tone and oh, stuff like that. So he might break. We'll have to take him like this. Oh, yeah. yeah he's so cool. Yeah, we can put him in one of the candles and he'll be... No, 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 I tried putting him into a 
regular school and it was a lot of difficulties there and I'd have to find someone to just work one-on-one -on -one with him in that regular school. I had to pay the full salary of a teacher for just him and the living expenses and to get the work permit sorted out. And then the worry of trying to find someone that I felt was suitable for Myron and that was good for him. It just got to be so expensive financially. You know, it was just in so many sleepless nights of crying, what's going on, what I'm going to do, and then, you know, I just didn't know what to do, and because I even considered moving away, and it was like, oh, I, do, I just can't do that. Another family in Green Turtle Key had a rude awakening as well. Eric started in the nursery school here. Then I was told that he wouldn't be able to continue on to the grade one level of the public school here. I would say it was devastating because I just never thought it was going to be a problem, really. I mean, it was going to be a problem to some extent, but not a no, he cannot attend the school. When the door was closed here, we tried a, a private school in Marsh Harbor. They asked us to remove him from the school which we did, and then we said, oh boy. They didn't feel like Eric should just stay at home and do nothing. He needed the social as well as the educational part, like every child needs. The situation with Lynn's boys made her suddenly aware there were other children who also faced a bleak future unless something could be done. The idea for Every Child Counts was born. Lynn was able to bring her experience and degrees in education, sociology, and psychology to kickstart the project. Like the old folktale, she persuaded others to bring what they could. The soup began to simmer. We really uh, started out with two little trailers that they put together. and uh, Myself and a couple buddies, we went up and put some paneling and did a wheelchair ramp and whatever we could do to get it going. Uh, give Miss Lynn this major hand any way we could. And uh, basically that's how it all started, out of two trailers at St. Francis de Sales. My name is Alonzo Williams. I started school here around about 13 or 14 years old. I was one of the first students here when we were in just a little small trailer. That was when it wasn't necessarily okay to go to ECC because it was still on to a regular school. And so anytime the regular, so-called regular students saw you go there, they automatically thought, well, oh, something's wrong with him. And so it was hard to go there and then have to come back into your classes and still be respected. And it, it's, it's an awful stigma. But the kids get used to it, unfortunately. You know, having to get used to being called retarded and stupid and... The school started slowly with a handful of students and grew to include many who were highly intelligent but struggling in the regular system. It began to accept developmentally delayed and physically challenged students for whom there was no place at all. But the taunting continued and the classrooms were cramped, so everyone decided they should move away from St. Francis to Sales and have their very own school. We decided to ask the Catholic Church for the use of that property where we're on now, which was the grounds for the first Catholic school here, and they went along with that. My first classroom was half of the kitchen. And I had like six little desks in there crammed in, and Miss Mel had the other half of the kitchen. That was my first classroom. <laughs> it's like, welcome to being a teacher. You have half a classroom, or half a kitchen. <laughs> As word of this unusual school spread in the community, enrollment rose and more people were inspired to contribute to the bubbling soup. I think that when we saw the kids, and we saw the program, it looked so pure. 
that uh, there were, they had obvious needs, um, but there was a, such a terrific spirit that it sort of compelled us to, uh, to come over here. And we were only gonna do it for a year. Um, we'll just do it for a year. We'll, we'll, we'll take a break, a sabbatical from where we're, what we're doing in Miami and we'll come over here for the year. And uh, it ended up to be about 10. Obviously it's not done for the finances, um, but it doesn't matter. There's so much, um, so many more stronger things that are involved here than, than, the, than the financials. Uh, I think that's the most compelling part of the program. It's a very pure experience. We, we do what we do because it's the right thing to do. We feel it's the right thing to do. Mr. Marr's wife, Melanie, works with the very youngest children and has seen how the nurturing environment of the school has brought about dramatic changes in the students over the years. What I have found in the children is they start to click as a group. As they are together over the year, the children will sort of help each other in the group and follow each other and they become sort of little friends and that they will um, help each other, take each other's hand, help them sit, help tell them what to do, tell them what to say. As they start to go into other classes a couple of years later, you will also see them start to work with some of the more severe children. <laughs> it's amazing what a cohesive little group they become. Um, towards each other and look out for each other. And I've seen that throughout the school. I think we also try to instill that. I mean, if they see us um, doing things for them and giving them a lot of love, I think they model that and they start doing it themselves. We're finding out that a lot of our children are coming from challenged homes. Just a single parent, no father, no assistants and they're struggling. So we try to help in any way. Some children come in, we have to supplement the uniform, the lunch. Some we have to get breakfast from in the morning and just be support. Some of the children have never had anybody just hug them and say, I love you. And it's hard when you're showing that here and you have to send them back home when they're getting no, no attention. So it's hard, and that's why we know they like to come to school when it's raining, when it's the storm, and they're here and we go, why are these children here? And you know it's because they know it's a place that accepts them, that loves them, and they're gonna get a warm meal and a hug, and you can't beat that. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. elbows back, elbows back. Feet apart, feet apart, knees together, knees together. When most of the students come, they have issues of self-esteem, issues of being valued, issues of feeling that they have something to give. There was so much around them saying, you're not important, you don't, you know, there's something wrong with you, you're different, you know, there's that. They didn't have the ability to grow as human beings because um, there was just so much hurt and so much other, um, emotions that were going on. I think the whole premise of what we do as teachers, the whole philosophy is that you are important, you do have value, you do have important contributions to make to the community and to each other. And once they begin to see that, what's really uh, positive about them comes out, you know. And it doesn't, I think it doesn't only come out for themselves, it comes out for everybody else. You know, they, once they feel valued, once they feel like they've been able to achieve, that they find positive things in themselves, then they see that in the other kids and they want to share that in the other kids and they have a great deal of compassion. They're quite sensitive to people um, being delegated as different or being delegated as inferior. And once they've come to terms with that in themselves, I think they've, they show a great deal of compassion and caring for the, their fellow students. Man. Don't think about it, buddy. I just scared to go up there, too. Don't think about dropping. There you go. Good. Almost there. 
You look terrific, can't keep doing You're this. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I think you can. Fuck, no sir. I think you can. As loud as you can. Many learning difficulties are not immediately obvious to an observer. I got all my kids when they were straight out of the regular school, and not one of them was able to read or do any math whatsoever. They were unfamiliar with most of the alphabet. They were in a big classroom in the regular school and the teachers did not have time to deal with them. They were all behavior problems because their teachers and classmates called them stupid because they couldn't read. So they were a bunch of thugs. It's frustrating for, for kids that, that aren't getting the lesson down packed in the classroom because, you know, the smart students always go up front and so you don't get the attention you need and so it's frustrating and you don't wanna, you don't wanna be scrutinized for not knowing the lesson or not getting it or asking more than once to be, to, for it to be repeated and so you tend to act out and not really care for the lesson. As far as what the children have accomplished, I don't think anything really surprised me because the kids were so determined that they were going to do it. And they work hard. You know, and they, they aim to please. They don't want to disappoint anybody. You know? Because for the first time in their life, somebody's saying, you know what, you can do this. And you are going to do this. And they do. Well, I have a lot of potential. I'm sure of that. And I don't think the teachers at my old school understood that because they weren't really helping me learning. When I come to ECC, if I get stuck in words, the te teachers help me to read and I get better at reading. They don't put that much stress on you like my old school. They just help you a lot. And if you don't know a word or you don't know what that is, they just help you with it. All you have to do is just raise your hand and they, and they help you. Um, and they used to give you spelling. They used to give you like um, hospital and all them words, and they couldn't know I couldn't spell them. So then they, then they, they shut. They shut. My mom, my my dad actually put me in the school, and I get a little better, like I can read now. The teachers don't spank you. They rob a little bit. <laughs> well, I felt like. I wouldn't be able to do anything in life if I had stayed at that school, and uh, I talked to my mother about that, and that's one of the reasons why she moved me here. Have you done yours, Marty? What was it? Very nice. What else? Number two. Nobody here at this school is stupid. Everybody can learn, and each one of us teachers have proved it. Because when they came to us, they couldn't do these things, and now they can which is pretty amazing. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of rewards. <laughs> the ongoing success of the school, just like the tastiness of the stone soup, is directly dependent on the additions to the pot coming from the community. It's been a gigantic challenge to fund the school with more and more children arriving on the doorstep. New buildings were needed. Donations came from generous individuals to pay for the materials, and volunteers offered their labor and expertise. We knew from the start that it was going to be a challenge. The government services and the Catholic Board, I think, they were very clear with us and very honest with us as to what their resources were and, what, and that their support was there, but that realistically, um, the funding just wasn't available. 
The Bahamian government has managed to find funding for one teacher, but everything else has to be covered by donations. The responsibility for finding all this revenue is up to Lynn. I mean, we certainly have a number of foundations that support us with larger donations from about $25,000 a year. But there also are a lot of small donations. We have a lady from uh, Father Stan's parish who's a Portuguese immigrant in Massachusetts who sends $20 a month to the school. And so, I mean, some very touching, you know, s donations from people who, where it's a, it's a challenge for them to do that, but they do it. So it takes from little to big to, to really make it work. Lynn is very good at making it all work, but stable funding is a constant worry. Fundraising evenings are frequent events at local establishments throughout Abaco. A group of professional musicians from Texas perform benefit concerts, adding much needed funds to the pot. Like a precious gem you wait and see. Ah! Yeah. Just let me hold you, let me hold you, let me hold you, let me hold you. Here there is an added bonus. The kids get to sing with the pros and have a great time. Welcome everyone to Voices of the Ocean. This is our benefit concert for the fantastic organization Every Child Counts. We are Music Doing Good from Houston, Texas. We want to thank you all for coming out and supporting a fantastic cause like this wonderful organization that you can feel proud to be a part of here in the Bahamas. And ooh, I might be better off with a steady life and a steady job. But nothing I would rather be than chancing it as a submarine. And ooh, I might be A world away from the gentle pace of Marsh Harbor, in the heart of Canada's largest city, academic resources, which are just as important as funding, are being added to the bubbling soup. Uh, Lynn Majors and I have a mutual friend, Mary Gottlieb, who one day took me to meet this incredible woman of heart. And we clicked from the start. I mean, it was clear to me that Lynn was someone who gave back to people in the community, and my work in Canada was in the area of social justice and then began to talk about her needs financially and what kinds of help she needed in the school, and I knew Ryerson could deliver. We're a university that has programs that are focused on disability, that are focused on social work and community service. We do research, we have arts programs here, so we've got faculty and students that could give back quite easily. And that began a process of bringing more and more students and faculty to become involved with ECC. So I knew that we had a program up here called Early Childhood Studies where the students do courses in disability and do placements in disability. So they had curriculum skills and experience that would be of use to Lynn in the classroom. As the ECS students, we are taught to observe the children and through their interests, plan accordingly. Right. So um, I noticed that they loved cooking. And um, so what I did with them was every week I implemented a cooking activity. Mm -hmm. um, the last week that I was there, um, the children wanted to make conch salad and they taught me how to make it. So that was a great experience. It's something that they, they got to teach me and something right. that I came out learning. I personally loved working in Mr. Mars' classroom. The students were so engaging. Mm -hmm. They were always really excited to show me, you know, all their different drawings that they had done throughout the day and to interact with me and, you know, even just to kind of um, like touch my hands and, you know, get a hug. 
and all those different types of things. So it was, yeah. you know, very touching. Yeah. Um, going into it, I expected to actually uh, be the one um, giving and be the one offering my skills and my experience and mm -hmm. what I have learned here at Ryerson. Great. But what I ended up receiving um, coming out of um, the school was um, a lot that I learned from the staff working at ECC, the children, the community, and just the culture. Um, I didn't expect that. I was just amazed just receiving so much from the school mm -hmm. and the community. Our students are changing. They're taking the academic side of what they've learned here and the skill sets that they've learned, and they're learning that when you go someplace else, you have to adapt to that environment, and you have to listen to the needs of the people that you're working with. When you bring those skills back here, they're learning they have to do the same thing in different kinds of communities within Toronto, within Canada. So I think it's mutually beneficial, and I watch these students say it's the best thing that's ever happened to them in their life and that it's fundamentally changed them. And I get some of them back in my classes again at the upper levels, and I can see the change. Their understanding of the content that I teach in human rights is more sophisticated. They can bring examples to share with other students. Their understanding that each individual has agency, that one person can help another person. It really made me think about the privileges that I have here in Canada. And now working as a social worker, I work with youth and, um, and I also work with a lot of immigrants. Being able to advocate for my, for, for my clients, now I find that the experience I gained in the Bahamas is, is what is impactful for me here in the work that I do. I talk about you drop a stone in the water and there's this ripple effect that goes out to other people and that's what they're learning from ECC that their one experience there is a ripple effect that not only on the students of the community there but coming back here on their friends and their families and their colleagues. The University of Dubuque and Rollins College from the United States have also benefited from relationships with ECC bringing young students with diverse talents to enrich the program and themselves. I, know, I guess I can hope I can bring like a new experience to them in the United States and um, we have some really fun lesson plans. Um, I'm with like the general education and we're going to be doing some theater so I hope the kids have fun with that. These student visitors and volunteers are adding to an already stimulating atmosphere. Because of money always being so tight, Lynn and the entire staff have become very inventive in creating their educational programs. And where are we going to put the leaves? What's the name of the bin that we put the leaves in? The come. Good job. Very good. Help her out. The leaves that we put in the compost are going to turn into? Right. Yes. Dirt. Very good. And what are we going to use the dirt for? Soil. Very good. Right. Soil. It's going to turn into soil. Some of the kids are on meds. And the farming program helps to calm them down and put their mind in gear for learning when they go back to the classroom. Come on, come on. There you go. Good job. A lot of them come in stressed out. <laughs> Over, uh, whatever ha happened at home, they bring it to school, and then we have to deal with it. <laughs> and so they thought about using the farming program to assist them in the process of calming down and putting them in the frame of mind for learning. Come on. Good job. I love you too. Come on. You're doing well. Come on. You're doing well. There you go. Art classes too are about a lot more than just learning to draw. Well, Chris, we noticed at a really early age that he saw things differently and he really has this special appreciation for visual. And when we started noticing him doing his artwork, he, it was almost like the picture was there already and he was just making everyone else see it. It's truly amazing to be able to watch him because he knows exactly where things go. He knows exactly what should be done and he does it in a totally natural, unbiased way. Who's that? 
what are you doing? You're making a picture. Can you tell me what this is? There are days he'll come in, especially after the hurricanes this year, and he'll portray a very negative um, image, very stormy, everyone's unhappy, and all his pictures were reflected on the way it made him feel and the, the images he saw. Or there are some cases when he'll do, you know, um, a twist on Haitian living in the Bahamas. All his pieces are based on the Haitian communities and stuff like that. And just in the past couple of years, he's been able to be proud of his work. Like, he'll turn and he'll come to make sure you see his piece, to make sure you see it and appreciate it. One of my friends said to me, you have got to come to this school. This is an amazing place. I volunteer at it. Come on. So I came, met Lynn, met a number of the teachers, and uh, they invited me to come and start doing some, uh, an exercise program with them. And there was this openness, this willingness to say, hey, bring it on. Just come, bring it on. Whatever you can bring into the school, we, we want to give it a try. And so I started with that. And then um, I guess over the last three years, I've you know, developed this sensory program with two staff that, uh, that work with kids one-on-one, -on -one, integrated it into the classrooms. And uh, we're just so proud of it. I looked at that program, and that program in terms of the country is probably one of our best run or better run programs. They have always provided the service with a lot of love, a lot of care, and a lot of compassion. They have faced some heavy challenges, the limited resources, financial and stuff, but despite all of that, they have kept at it. It has been a pleasure to see them grow as they have, you know, Mrs. Major, bless her kind soul. The one aspect I always say to her is that, you know, she can't say no. Whenever there is a child out there, she keeps trying to help more and more. But we do need more people like that in this country. You're happy? And was it I hope you get a sense of Lynn Major, the, the love she has for kids, for human beings the faith she has for knowing that there can be a, a better place for children. She's a visionary leader. Uh, she's a wonderful communicator. Um, she's one who knows when to, to, to be forceful and when also to sit back and to allow things to happen. And um, I, I really congratulate her. Ms. Lynn is a godsend. And I thank God for ECC every day of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, we look forward, he look forward to going to school sometime. It is holiday time, and he said, Mommy, um, I could just go. I said, no, Tyler, it's holiday time. Thank God for ECC. When I drop her off to school and I left her there, well, you know a mother, she's going to be nervous. But never for one moment, never for one moment, was I skeptical about leaving her there. They embraced her, they took her in, they treated her so well. I was never uncomfortable leaving her one, there one day. They were great. And they still are. <laughs> the real blessing that I've been given is the recognition that while I came here to help, what I've recognized is that this school has in turn blessed me with feeling like um, not just that I contribute, but these children enrich my life. The teachers enrich my life. It's just it's amazing. Ready, break. 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 Yeah. Break Volunteers and donors are the fire underneath the simmering soup. And every year, the children invite them to a very special party. Break. Whenever they hold these events, it's hard to tell who's having the most fun, students or audience. It's a chance to demonstrate how all the support they've received from both the school and the community has brought out new dimensions and abilities no one ever thought they had.
Just like the stone soup, the presence of the school in Abaco has had a positive effect on the community. Attitudes have changed. You could put another row right here. The community has been fabulous in terms of its um, support of the school in so many ways, financially, yes, but also uh, in terms of providing all means of uh, support by placement of the students in the various businesses. They've been very helpful. You did very well. In, in yeah. um, Very supportive community here. And that's the, that's the really nice thing about working in a sort of in a small community. People uh, get to understand very quickly um, uh, who we are and what the needs are. Good morning, babe. The kids, the students themselves are our best ambassadors and, and are the ones that uh, are changing the attitudes within the community the most. Uh, they're out in the community doing it every day. Long gone are the days when LaTanya was reduced to tears by teasing in the regular school. Her work placement opportunity at Abaco Ceramics led to the discovery of a talent no one knew she had and has resulted in a blossoming career. Her artistic creations have found homes and collections around the world. Jamal McEwen is another success story. In a lot of ways, if, if you didn't know these things about him, you would never even suspect that he had these disabilities. If you see him around his peers, um, they carry on the same kind of conversations, he does everything. It's just when it comes to doing some academic stuff, uh, figuring out money, uh, um, who to trust and who not to trust, just making these little everyday life decisions, which could make um, uh, uh, be a very serious determining factor on positive, something positive happening to you or something negative. This is where he had a lot of his problems for a long time. As a matter of fact, he's still struggling with that, and he's 26 years old. But um, um, it did good for him because he was able, um, about four or five years ago, to go to work on his own. He'd go to sea, and before, I, I couldn't even imagine him doing that. ECC gave him self-assurance and built up his self-esteem. They hold on to you, per se, the student, until they really feel confident in you that you can go out into the real world. It's not a, a No Child Left Behind program where it's, you know, just kind of push them out of there. You, you actually get the attention, you get fully groomed uh, academically, and when they feel good enough, they, they release you. Outside the comforting environment of the school lurks the big, wide world, and older students are being prepared for its bumps and hurdles. It's not fair. Is life fair? No. Do things always happen in your, in your direction? No. No? Okay. What do you do when life isn't fair? Fair. Try to make it fair. How do you do that? Ask you to talk about it. Yes, I would. And that was another good thing about this school. They didn't just teach you book work. They, they taught you how it would be to go out into the real world and work. We went out and did jobs and get ready, prep work for, the, for out there. We had a hard time with Mr. Mars because we didn't understand exactly what he was teaching us when it come to you being on the work field and not always being able to voice your opinion about every situation. Some situations you gotta sit back and just let it be and a lot of things happen on the work field and I found myself sitting back and saying wow Mr. Mars taught me that and now I see what he was saying and I remember we did parenting classes and learn how to budget money and how to change pampas and stuff like that and now I'm a father with with a eight month year old daughter and if not for Mr. Mars teaching me how to change pampas years ago I might not know how to do it now but a lot of the stuff has come into play and so I'm grateful to him to Mr. Mars. <laughs> Eric goes grocery shopping, banking, post office. He does washing. Yeah, I didn't even know he could do that. 
it's all useful. I mean, what do you need to do in life? You need to be able to go to the grocery store. You need to be able to go to the post office. You need to be able to go to the bank. We kind of spoil Eric, so he wouldn't have never gotten it from us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yum, yum. I don't want another $100 glass of milk, though. Oh, yes. Mm-mm. Uh-huh. Call me. He got me a glass of milk last night, and he said, he held it away from me, wouldn't give it to me. He said, $100. <laughs> I'm like, what for a glass of milk? You got to be kidding me. Oh, you. Everybody wants to be something. I don't care who you are. Once you... Once you're born on this earth, you want to be something. That's your goal. It's just not a lot of people are given the chance to actually make it. And this school, that's what this school is, a chance to make it. Even though my disabilities, what I can do, but I keep on trying and trying harder to try and do it again. And I trying to go to college or university. I like to be an airline pilot and like to go to flight school to learn how to do it. I want to go to college to know what carpenter. Me having a company and be my own boss and like make products. My dream job is to be a boat mechanic. A professional baseball player or a ba football or basketball player. A basketball player? A video game designer. Football player or basketball player. A heavy duty machine mechanic. I like to be a pilot. And a carpenter. A fisherman. A heavy equipment operator. I like to be a video game designer and a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Every Child Counts came about because Lynn refused to accept the idea Vincent and James didn't fit into the regular school and should just stay home. Now they're grown, she recognizes there's another challenge. It's always a challenge to keep everything going, but my personal conviction is, and I'm sure fed by James and Vincent, but also by all the other children is that I am really not prepared for them not to continue to be part of the community. And the only way that they are going to be part of this community is to have some kind of sheltered employment, which would be the training center, the employment center, where if they can't go out to work, they have a place to be. Because that, that is their life. That is their community. Those are their friends. Into the Bubbling Soup has gone one big unexpected donation to start the sheltered workshop. And the boys at ECC now all want to become heavy equipment operators. The next step after that would hopefully be a small residence. Um, many of our kids, as you've seen, are in very good homes, but others are in very, um, not very good homes and not very supportive homes and I don't know what will happen to them. So my wish is that we can keep the school going and continue into those other programs. Back when the school was just an idea, Lynn didn't realize how much the community would be inspired to dig down and find something, anything, to help make it happen. It has always amazed me, you know, that um, so many people do help in so many different ways. And really, it's the only, re I, I've said it before, but it's the truth. It's the only reason why we've been able to continue and have the impact on the kids that we do. What people have said to me anyway when I ask them is that they came to give because they know the need is there. They see the need in the children. But what happens is that they receive more than they give. And so, um, I think the spirit of the children has um, a genuine effect on people. They're very giving, they're very loving. Our children have, and the most vulnerable among us have great gifts that they give. And when those gifts are responded to, um, your society and your community become so much richer and so much 
more meaningful.